Hello, I'm Nadia, and today's topic is the fall of France in 1940, which is arguably the most humiliating and astonishing defeat of World War II. It was astonishing because France at that time had the largest and best equipped military of all of Europe, and on paper at least it should have been perfectly capable of seeing off any attempted invasion by Germany. And yet what followed during the defence of France was a complete debacle. To understand how things could possibly have gone so wrong, we need to wind back to 1938, when Hitler annexed Austria. France and Britain were extremely keen to avoid war in Europe. And they adopted a policy of appeasement towards Hitler. They turned a blind eye to the annexation of Austria. And later the same year, they met Hitler in Munich to agree terms that allowed Hitler to annex what was Czechoslovakia. And this was quite a shameful betrayal of the Prague government who weren't invited to this meeting or consulted about their own country's territorial borders. Now Hitler saw the extreme lengths to which Britain and France were prepared to go in order to avoid war. And rather than appeasing him and curtailing his desire to acquire more and more territory, it had quite the opposite effect. It emboldened him to invade another country, Poland, in 1939. And Hitler assumed, correctly, that although France and Britain had declared war on Germany for this invasion and had promised military support to their ally Poland, they actually did not follow through on their fine promises, and they left Poland to fight Hitler alone. Now, with hindsight, we can see that had France and Britain followed through on their commitment of military support to Poland, that World War II could have been ended before it really began, right here in Poland. But instead, what happened was that by the 17th of September, Hitler's co-conspirator, Stalin, in the Soviet Union, saw that nobody was coming to Poland's assistance, and so he invaded Poland as well from the east. This was game over for the Polish government and the military, and they evacuated into uh, Hungary and Romania they didn't surrender to either Germany or the Soviet Union. Their intention was that they would regroup with their ally, France, where they would form a government and military in exile, which together with their ally, France, would launch a counteroffensive against Germany to liberate Poland, or so they thought. A Polish brigade that had been fighting in southeast Poland was the 10th Cavalry Brigade, led by Stanisław Maciek, this man. Its proximity to the Hungarian border meant that the brigade was able to evacuate quickly as an intact unit. And one of these men was my father, Marcin Rukniak, here on the right. Upon arrival in Hungary, the Poles were placed in internment camps. But these camps were only lightly guarded and the Poles were able to visit nearby uh, towns where the locals gave them civilian clothes in which they could make their escape. The Polish embassy in Budapest swung into high gear, producing fake travel documents, describing the men as tourists and students. The speed with which the Poles reached France is a testament to their determination to liberate their country. 
within just a couple of weeks, Władysław Sikorski was appointed the Prime Minister in Exile and Commander-in-Chief of the Polish Armed Forces in Paris. Just a month later, Maciek uh, was also in Paris and was appointed the uh, head of the Polish army. And this photo from my father's service records shows that he also arrived in Paris by the end of October in 1939. The experience of these Poles when they arrived in France is quite revealing as to the attitude of the French high command. On arrival, the Poles were housed in barracks in Kirkudan in Brittany. And in the left-hand photograph, you can see Poles dressed in civilian clothing waiting to enlist. By May 1940, 80,000 Poles had signed up. 45,000 of these were veterans from the invasion of Poland and they were eager to fight. They were joined by another 35,000 volunteers who were mostly Polish emigres living in France and Belgium. The Poles were dependent on the French army for everything, uniforms, rations, accommodation, weapons and equipment. On the right, you can see my father dressed in French World War I army surplus uniform. The Poles were desperate to liberate their country as quickly as possible. They had been forced to leave their families and defenseless civilians at the mercy of two brutal regimes led by Hitler and Stalin. Their whole nation was depending on them. So Maciek made repeated requests to the French commanders for equipment with which to train his men. But he was dumbfounded when his requests for tanks and armour were repeatedly denied. They didn't even have enough rifles, so some infantrymen had to train using sticks. The Poles were baffled by the unwillingness of France to equip their army. As I've already said, France had the best equipped military in all of Europe, and also had impenetrable fortifications against an attack from Germany. Desperately trying to instill a sense of urgency into the French high command, the Poles prepared a dossier detailing what they had learned about German tactics during the invasion of Poland. It contained critical information about the speed of the German assault that had led to a breakdown in communications and it proposed effective countermeasures. This contained important information that could have been great benefit to the French, but their report wasn't even read. In a curt reply, they said, we French have the Maginot line and have no need presently for the Polish armoured division. This rebuttal reflects the diametrically opposed views of the Polish and French High Command. Rather than taking the initiative by attacking Germany as the Poles chose, they waited and took a defensive strategy, waiting for Germany to attack them. This reflects a complacency and an overconfidence in their military superiority. Rather than seeing the Polish army as battle-hardened veterans with relevant experience of German military tactics, they viewed the Polish army as incompetent fools to have been overrun so quickly. The whole of the French border with Germany was protected by an impressive series of anti-tank fortifications and gun posts known as the Maginot Line. So an attack on France from Germany would have to come through Holland and Belgium. So accordingly, the French knew that they would have to position their troops 
here at the border with Belgium. Importantly, the French believed that this region, the Ardennes Forest, was also impenetrable to an attack by Germany. And as you'll see in a moment, that assumption proved to be incorrect. In addition to the French troops, there were over a million troops of other nationalities preparing for an invasion. But there was a failure to coordinate these resources into a unified plan. Holland and Belgium had both declared themselves neutral, so they did not have a formal military alliance with France or Britain. Between them, they had 700,000 troops, but their equipment was mostly obsolete. France's closest ally, Britain, had sent 400,000 of its best troops, the British Expeditionary Force. But the Polish army was held back here, far away from the expected point of invasion of France, without tanks or equipment at their base in Kirkudan. On the 10th of May 1940, Winston Churchill was appointed the new Prime Minister of Great Britain, and he was someone who took a far more combative st stance against Hitler than his predecessor Neville Chamberlain. On the very same day, the attack on France began, and German troops invaded Holland and Belgium, quickly overrunning their troops. The Belgian government requested assistance from France and as Germany had correctly predicted, French and British troops then crossed the Belgian border to meet the attack from Germany. But this was actually just a way to lure the Allied forces into Belgium and it was a trap into which they fell because the main assault from Germany into France came through the Ardennes Forest, which the French had mistakenly assumed was impassable. And this thrust circled up behind the British and French troops, pinning them down on the beaches of Belgium and France. Churchill called the situation a colossal military disaster that had stranded the root, core and brain of the British Army. So the British ordered an urgent evacuation of their troops from Dunkirk, which proceeded from the 26th of May to the 4th of June. Ships of all sizes, under heavy aerial bombardment, managed to evacuate a staggering 340,000 troops from northern France and brought them back to Britain. The British army lost 68,000 men and had to abandon nearly all of their tanks, vehicles and equipment in France. Suddenly, the attitude of the French to the Poles changed completely. According to General Maciek, they wanted the Polish armoured division and they wanted it now, immediately, in a hurry. The Poles were transferred to the outskirts of Paris, where to their astonishment there were huge depots of tanks, guns and ammunition, all of the supplies they had been denied for the past seven months. If I had been in their situation, I would have had some choice words with the French. Why should I put my life at risk to fight for France? when they had done nothing to help me or my country in our hour of need. But General Sikorsky simply couldn't conceive that the mighty French army could possibly be defeated by Germany. He saw this as an opportunity for Poland. If the Polish army helped their ally to defeat the Nazis, the French would owe them a moral debt to liberate Poland in return. And so with only a few days to train on their new Renault tanks, the Poles were rushed to the French front line. 
German tanks and infantry were pouring into northern France and reached Paris on the 14th of June. With the fall of the capital, the British ordered another frantic evacuation of troops out of France from the 15th to the 25th of June. Operation Ariel is almost unknown compared to the earlier evacuation from Dunkirk, and yet it involved the withdrawal of a further 200,000 Allied troops from France, most of them British. Meanwhile, the Poles were sent to protect the flanks of French divisions fighting in northeastern France. But when they arrived, the front was disintegrating under the pressure of the attack and the gaps in defensive lines were too large for them to plug. So the best they could do was to provide cover to retreating French infantry divisions. On the 16th of June, Matchek had orders to secure the town of Mombar. He was to prepare an advance guard for the French 42nd Infantry Division. Mombar was already occupied by German troops and Maciek knew from the Polish campaign that the German army rested at night. They didn't fight. So he devised an audacious strategy to attack them in the dead of night. It was a bloody battle with heavy casualties on both sides, but by morning the Poles had succeeded in taking Mombar. They sent a messenger to notify the French 42nd Division that the town was secure. But their messenger returned, saying that the French were nowhere to be found. The Poles simply couldn't believe that they had been abandoned, almost out of fuel and ammunition and about to be surrounded by German troops. Maciek reluctantly gave the order to retreat. The Poles were astounded when the French government signed an armistice with Germany on the 22nd of June. Although the capital had fallen, there was still everything to fight for. About half of the country wasn't even occupied by the Germans. Under the terms of the armistice, the north of France became a zone of German occupation, while a new regime was installed in the south of France, which cooperated with the Nazis. The armistice went into effect on the 22nd of June, so the evacuation of Allied soldiers had to be completed by that date from the remaining ports in southwest France. General Sikorsky had an explosive meeting with General Weygan, the French commander-in-chief, who had advised the French government to surrender. Furious at what he called the paralysed defeatism at the top of France's military and political commands, he stormed out of the meeting, shouting that France could capitulate, but that Poland had every intention of continuing the fight. Sikorsky flew at once to London to meet with Winston Churchill, where the pair agreed a new military alliance in which the Polish troops would be evacuated to Britain and serve under British command. My father was evacuated from France on the 21st of June. He was on board one of two Polish ships that left Saint-Jean-de-Loup that day, each carrying about 4,500 men. In all, about 25,000 Polish troops were evacuated you can see from this photo that on board the massively overcrowded ships, there was little provision of food or water. And the journey to Plymouth took a full two days because the ships needed to take a detour into the Atlantic to avoid German U-boats. So on board the ships during this journey, the Poles had plenty of time to think about what had just happened.
not least, how on earth had this disastrous calamity befallen them? Their number had dwindled to only a quarter of the men who had flocked to France to fight. And instead of liberating Poland, their objective had slipped even further away. Why had France been so unwilling to help them, or even to save themselves? In Poland, hell was being let loose on defenceless civilians, including their parents, wives and children. What would become of them now? The Poles were on their way to Britain, a country about which they knew almost nothing. What kind of reception would they receive there? I'll tell you what happened to the Polish troops next, another time. The defeat of France wasn't only a calamity for Poland, and France obviously. With the most powerful army in Europe defeated so swiftly, countries all over Europe fell like dominoes under Nazi occupation or influence. This map shows Europe at the peak of Nazi occupation in 1942. Nobody could have imagined the devastating loss of life that would follow. 20 million people died just in Europe, of whose 6 million were Jews. Could this all have been averted if France and Britain had taken a stronger stance against Hitler when he invaded Poland? Protecting our freedom from brutal dictatorships is as relevant today as it was in World War II. Nobody wants war or bloodshed, and especially if it involves helping a country we've hardly even heard of. But history shows us how quickly a situation can escalate if we do nothing. I hope you learned something new from this video. Please give me a like below and subscribe to my channel. And thank you for watching.